within awareness we can move like a probe our attention we are aware of this of this auditorium we are aware of this hall we are aware there's a podium here but and there's a cup sitting here we can put our attention on this corner of the podium or we can put our attention on this cup we are aware of both but we can move our attention the secret of good meditation is the maneuverability of attention the secret is can we move our attention where we like if we can do that we are successful if we cannot we need practice yes sir i don't know if he if he had could he still have got the grace of great master master's grace is unlimited he is uh, well let me tell you about his grace since you have asked there are uh, different there are different chiefs as it were at different levels of experience like we live in a country like united states there's president bush who runs the administration in this country he is elected by the people and he becomes the president he gets certain powers just by being the president and he can veto a, a, a veto a bill passed by a majority in in the house one man can do it because we given him that power we given power to various individual souls operating through different forms to do certain things similarly in inner experiences there are many forms of power people who control in this uh, the the physical world and the astral world or sensory world which are mixed together are controlled by one single power of a being called naranjan that's the name we given him and that being is called god in most of the scriptures when we talk of the creator we talk of naranjan as god he said god created this universe god created in such a form we are referring to that creator we have never talked anything above that so when we talk of that god that god created this universe and god created the unseen universe we are talking only of that god now that god has the power to oversee all this reincarnation any killings anybody has done any punishments that person has received and so on there are similarly other powers at different points and they are souls going through certain time limits one soul may have done such good job he become naranjan and he remains there for 1 million years and runs the universe for that time during his tenure things will happen and he sees to it that the laws are administered that all laws of karma go through properly if somebody kills must be punished if somebody is merciful must be rewarded so he is seeing to it that all the law of karma is operating properly the masters come from areas way above any of these great deities or gods or powerful beings in different levels of consciousness masters identify themselves with total consciousness which is the creative power that creates these beings it's beyond all that it's totality that the masters represent so when masters come they are they are full of love and compassion more than anything else the other beings whom we call god and by different names in naranjan these beings are the ones who administer justice here you do wrong i'll punish you you do good i'll reward you they are doing that the masters are so compassionate they don't look at our weakness they look at our potential and our future now i'll give you an actual true story a man came to great master and he said master you have told me not to drink alcohol not to eat meat not to go and womanize and enter into vicious circles last night i did everything i did everything that you had forbidden me to do i am a great sinner i led a very bad life and i disobeyed you master forgive me master said don't do it again okay i forgive you the man said thank you master thank you and he ran away it upset the intellectual secretary is a lot who was sitting there they said master this man violates all your rules we people are trying to follow your rules so sincerely so diligently and we are waiting for our rewards in due course this man breaks all your rules just comes to you say forgive me master you say forgiven and he runs away what kind of justice is this master smiled he said look after all he asked for forgiveness i had to forgive him they said but 
supposing master he does the same things again and comes again will you again forgive him master said i think i'll again forgive him they said but supposing master he does not come to you and does the same things again will you still forgive him master said i think i'll still forgive him master when will you punish him he said look my dear friends first of all his own mind is punishing him more than anyone else secondly all the other people people worship as gods are punishing him why do you want me to add me on to the category of punishers leave me on the side of compassion these great masters come from a totally different area they come with love and compassion if they did not have that love and compassion none of us have any chance if they came to judge us by these laws of what we have done and what we have not done we have no chance look at our own lives look at our own backgrounds we would be just paying off our karma all the time they would say all right we are going to enforce justice and therefore first pay your karma and then come back when you are ready we won't be ready we haven't been ready for so many incarnations millions of years we have spent without being ready we are dependent upon their compassion and love alone therefore that question was not really relevant so far as great masters goes it would be relevant if there was somebody else one who just wielded equal justice therefore i was not concerned whether he killed or did not kill i knew he was a gangster and to say he killed was worse than robbed i don't even know if that is true what he did was bad enough that the master initiated that man the master turned him into a mystic into a holy saint that the master turned him from a thief into a saint was a miracle enough for me i didn't care if he had killed anybody so when we talk of these great masters plms they are so great we cannot bind them down by the mental rules of justice or fair play they don't indulge in fair play they indulge in love and compassion beyond fair play they break the rules when they want to give love to us they break the rules when they want to be compassionate to us thank god they break the rules that's all i can say that they break the rules in our favor i never seen them breaking the rules in their favor <laughs> and the great thing is they come to give not to take i have never seen a great master coming and saying give me 25 dollars i'll pray for you never seen that <laughs> they come to give they earn with their own hands they make their own living out of that they share their living with us they share their dollars with us and then they share their time with us and they share their experience with us and above all they share their love with us let's keep them as they are let's not tell them change you are not just enough the injustice or the unfairness of their behavior is to our advantage because they are giving more love and more compassion than we deserve let's get it while the going is good any of you have done that before don't mind because this is something that bears repetition even when we do it our minds are so strong and can become so negative that our minds can draw us astray even after we think we have been perfect the mind can create doubt the mind can create fear the mind can create a desire and a temptation and any one of these three things takes us away when we try to sit behind the eyes it's a very simple exercise it does not require a headstand it does not require putting your uh, legs one above the other it does not require extremely difficult yogic postures it only requires you sit in a comfortable position so comfortable that you are not distracted by any discomfort in the body but not so comfortable that you go to sleep that's the only requirement because when we are sitting or relaxing or lying down comfortably if we are in extreme comfort we go to sleep the idea is not to go to sleep but be comfortable so you can find your own asana your own posture your own position own body position which is comfortable enough but not one that induces sleep when you get into that position in the body once you have done it you practice which is the appropriate position for you in the body after that consider the body as your house as your residence as your mansion as your car as a vehicle and not as yourself this body being a vehicle in which you are sitting then imagine or contemplate where are you sitting then if this body is a cover around you it's a house where are you in it are you on the 6th floor here in the 5th floor 4th floor where are you in this body 
Just contemplate and come to your own realization, there you are. If you want a tip, I can give you, but you don't need it. That if you start exploring the body and ask this question to yourself, where am I? Very quickly you will find you are not in the fingertips or in the hands or the legs or the feet. You are conscious of them. You can move them. You can operate them. But you are doing all this from the head. It comes up very quickly. Because of consciousness operating in the brain center, basically in wakeful state, you will very quickly, in few minutes, find out that you are there. Somebody calls you with your eyes closed. Where are you? I am here. You don't have to turn your head if you are in the heart. But you turn like this, knowing that this is where you are and the eyes are in front of you. When you want to turn, the head seems to turn automatically. Because of your localization in the physical body, the same thing happens even when you ask a question, where am I as a conscious being inside this body? Once you start exploring, it doesn't take too long that you will find that you are really operating from some point in the head. If you narrow down the field, where are you really operating from as a single point of consciousness? That point narrows down to a point behind the eyes. If you hold your fingers like this and these fingertips are your eyes, you put them like this horizontally, then where these fingers meet is approximately the place where you, where you experience being conscious inside the head. Now it's a natural state. It's not created by anybody. When we are awake and we are in this physical body, that location of consciousness or a feeling we are conscious there is natural. And I am constantly telling you in the wakeful state, because in other states, this is not true. In other states, you don't feel you are there. In the wakeful state in which we are now going to do this practice, this experiment, in this wakeful state, the feeling is we are behind the eyes. We close the eyes, open the eyes, close the eyes. We know the eyelids are right in front of us. We know it's from behind the eyes that we are looking. That the eyeballs and the whole apparatus of the head is where all this perception, all this thinking, all this contemplation, all the questioning, all the seeking is going on. So it's all in the head that we have to operate. The rest doesn't matter. But some of you who may have done other kinds of yoga of the different energy centers may have a tendency to be drawn down quickly. Or if you have a tendency to sleep quickly when you are relaxing, you have a tendency to be drawn down quickly. Whether you do yoga or not, the focus of attention, which is here at the wakeful time, descends every night when we go to sleep. When we go to sleep and have dreams, it's already down here. In other words, at night, when we are dreaming, if we were to wake up and not open our eyes and say, let's touch our eyes just as the dream is broken and we woke up. Supposing you are dreaming with your rapid eye movement and somebody wakes you up. The rapid eye movements can be seen that you are dreaming and you are awoken and he says, touch your eyes. You will touch your throat. Did you know that? You can try it out. If you don't want anybody else's assistance, but you want your own assistance, then when you are going to sleep tonight and you're just falling off asleep, before going to sleep, you touch your eyes, you will do like this with your hands. As soon as you start going to sleep and you uh, repeat, touching your eyes, you touch your nose. That means the descent of this notional focal point of consciousness starts even as you start sleeping. So we as yogis, born yogis, we perform yoga every night. We shift the focal point to the throat center for dreaming, to the heart center for deep sleep and forgetful dreaming and so on. This, this heart, throat and eyes is a constant movement every day, every night. If we are used to sleeping, then also there will be tendency to go to sleep now during these exercises. If we are alert and we are scientific seekers, we don't want to miss out on anything, then we'll stay awake and stay here. If we have been yogis practicing yoga of the lower chakras, then the tendency will be to go down again and again. My suggestion is, we don't want to do any exercise in blindness. We don't want to do any exercise in hypnosis. We don't want to do any exercise in mesmerization. We don't want to do any exercise in sleep. We want to do exercise fully awake. More awake if possible, but certainly not less awake. That being the position, we cannot afford to go below the eye center. So in all the exercises that you will do with me in the workshop, you will make sure you do not go below the eye center. You're always conscious that you are here. 
Every time you miss it out, you can again even use your hands to touch and feel that you are still there. So when we locate this position behind the eyes, it is not a place to seek and search and sit down on. It's a place to find where we naturally are and be there. When the masters say, be at the third eye center, what they refer to is, be conscious of where you are operating from, not operating to. If you look at something, you are operating to that point in consciousness. When you are operating from, you are at the third eye center, from where the attention is flowing out to the point where you are getting experiences. We are trying to withdraw back to where we are. To aid in this experience of being at the third eye center, one can use one frequently forgotten, easy, natural method called imagination. Supposing your attention doesn't want to go to the next room, or supposing your attention doesn't want to go to the Christmas tree outside, opposite what Huntington, wherever it is. Supposing your attention doesn't want to go to that tree, you try doesn't, start imagining that you are seeing that tree. It will go there. Supposing you don't want to think of a person, start imagining that person is there, the attention will go there. It's an aid to putting attention. So if you have a difficult time finding out where is this third eye center where I am supposed to be operating, I seem to be scattered all over, which indeed we are. We are scattered all over, scattered all over the body of which we are conscious and we are scattered through the body of everything that we have had experience around the world. So we are constantly so scattered. Sometimes it looks very difficult to be behind the eyes. Where are we? If we are scattered, we can imagine. We can imagine we are behind the eyes in the third eye center. When we imagine we are there, it brings us back there and makes us less scattered and brings the scattered attention back to where we are. So we can use imagination to be there. Let's try it out. Let's get into a comfortable position, the position of a true but natural yogi, and then perform the yoga of self-discovery first by the starting point at the third eye center. Just imagine you are there and just be still and be there and be more there and know more about where you are. Just explore where you are. Do nothing else. A lot of people wrote that. Some There's a, there's a whole uh, little booklet lying at back. I haven't read it fully yet. I think it's called love. <laughs> right behind. <laughs> I never heard that people, you'll see that. That interpretation you'll see right there. It's right there. I didn't write it though. So any errors on omissions? <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Any final question before we break for lunch? Then we'll come back again to the pursuing of this exercise in a more practical way, more successful way. Okay, thank you very much. Before we <coughs> broke up for lunch, we were uh, trying to understand what it is to be within, behind the eyes. And I hope the delicious lunch didn't distract us from that exercise. Did you enjoy the lunch? Yes. Those who did, please raise your hands. Those who are doing it for courtesy, please raise your hands. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we were, yes, Sam. I, I'm, very, I'm, I'm, I'm very confused. I'm having a lot of trouble with distinguishing between focusing your attention and withdrawing your attention. <laughs> the, same, like, the first question you ask when you say, go with it, you say, well, where's that? And wherever the answer is, you focus on it. You say, it's, you, going with it is seeing the light, you focus on the light. The going within is seeing the mass, you focus on the mass. The going within is, is whatever, whatever the answer is, you focus on it. So how, that's not withdrawing, that's focusing. So the uh, difficulty is with the word focusing. Because the way you are using the word focusing, you could as well focus on withdrawing. So what you mean by focusing in your statements is that where should we concentrate on? Well, if withdrawal of attention means pulling ourselves back to where we are throwing our attention out from, focusing would be to be at that place from where we are operating our attention outward. 
So that's you can use the word focusing. There's no trouble with the word focusing. The question is that the word focusing has been used by others as a means of fixing something in front of them, whether with eyes closed or open, and then putting concentration and attention on that point outside of themselves. If that is how focusing is used, then don't focus, but withdraw. But if focusing merely means concentrating your attention, then it's all right. Don't worry about the word. The process is simple. It worked with one friend of mine very well and very easily. I took a pencil. I don't have a pencil. Anybody has a pencil? Pen might do. I took a pen like this, a pencil like this in my hand because this very question was coming up. We don't understand what you mean by withdrawal. It's also focusing. Attention can only be focused. What do you mean by withdrawal of attention? Same question, same confusion. I said, all right. My friend, look at the tip of this pencil. Can you see it? I said, yes. Can you see it really clearly and only the pen and the point and nothing else? I said, yes. I said, is it becoming clearer and clearer? He said, yes. I said, what are you doing to make it clearer and clearer? He said, I am focusing more and more on the pen. I said, who is focusing? Me. From where? From there. Are you then aware of three things? You, focusing, pen. Watch each three separately. There are three things. You, the pen, and the focusing going on between the two. Can you be aware of all these three things? There is you, focusing. There is the pen being focused on. And there's the process of focusing going on between the two. He said, yes. Are you fully aware? He said, yes. I took a book and placed it in front of the pen. Where? Are, what's left? Pen is gone. Focusing is gone. What's left? He went back and was able to focus on withdrawal instantaneously. I'm just giving an illustration that in all use of attention, we have the self to put our attention on. We have the object of our attention and we have the process of attention flowing. It's always like that. If you are having this problem, cut the object of attention, cut the process of attention and what remains is the self. If you can cut those two and still be aware of what's left, you are withdrawing attention. Try and practice this way. Even with eyes closed, it makes no difference whether you have eyes open or you have eyes closed. When with the eyes closed, you see the master or an image of the master or an imagined image of the master or a contemplated vision of the master or of a beloved or God. When you have something you are seeing, there are only three things happening which you can be aware of. You are there seeing the master. What are the three things? You, master, seeing. You can be very quickly become aware this is what's happening. There's you, there's master, there's seeing. Cut the master out, cut the seeing out. What is left is the self. That's withdrawal of attention. If you withdraw and become conscious only of the one who was seeing the master, don't focus on it. Just be with it. Because that is you. You would have to focus if you have to travel. One has to focus on something if it is away from one. You really don't focus attention in the sense of moving your attention to a point if it is to be moved towards your own self. Because the self is the creator of attention. Self is the one from where the attention is coming out. So, while in the third eye, third eye center, when you feel you are there and things come and go and you don't pay any attention, master's picture comes, goes, some other forms come and go, some strange patterns, brown and black and white and red and purple come and go. They're moving like blobs of patterns. They just keep on moving. You don't, you don't turn your head, turn your eyes towards anything. Just let them go. You are busy with who is watching these. Is that me? Mind may be thinking, concept, what it's seeing. Forget seeing color, seeing images. Then in the middle of this of what it is seeing. Who is seeing? From where? Who is seeing? From where? Is it your mind seeing? From where? 
where are you located? That immediately pulls you back to where you are. That's the third eye center. No, from where you are actually seeing without listening. Now you are seeing me fr from that chair. You don't have to listen to the mind where you are seeing from. Because the very process of seeing convinces you where you are. But if, I'm, if, I'm, if my mind is, 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 is developing concepts about what I'm seeing, I'm seeing color, I'm seeing shapes, I'm seeing light, that means that then, then my focus is on the concept of light, color, and shape. So you are busy with what you are seeing. You are busy with what you are seeing. Why not have a break and say, I have spent so many minutes now on what I am seeing. Let me spend a moment on who is seeing. But then it's your mind telling you to focus on who you are, who are you are, who is doing the seeing. No. Why do you bring the mind in? Where, where does the mind, then you start seeing the mind. If the mind tells you, watch out where it's telling you from. And where are you sitting, listening to it? Supposing the mind is a voice. In your case, it, apparently, the mind speaks a lot of words, right? I, I don't know that it does. That's what you could tell it. No, what, does, what actually happens? Don't go by what I say. What, what happens to you when you are with eyes closed, contemplating where you are? What happens? When you close your eyes, and all that you have to contemplate on or think about is, where am I in the head? When you do that, what happens? Lights come in front, pictures come. You say, oh, I've seen enough of that. Now tell me, where am I? You ask yourself this question. And you want to figure out where you are. How do you figure out where you are? Supposing you were lost in a, in a dark room. in a. Who's uh, figuring it out? Is the mind figuring it out? Who is figuring out where you are? I thought it's the mind that figures it out. Okay. Is it separate from you? You're telling us it's separate. No, no, don't go by what I say. Tell me what your experience is. <laughs> Tell me what you are, what are you, what are you experiencing? Are you experiencing that you are the mind, that there's no difference? And therefore, when the mind asks question, you are asking that question. Is that right? Well, it's been 90% of my life. Okay. okay, stay with that right now. Till we come to a later exercise today to separate the two. Right now doesn't matter. Right now, we are not trying to separate the mind from the soul. We are trying to figure out where we are. Fortunately for us, at this time, the mind and soul are knotted so, so together, you can't separate them. At this time, the mind and soul are knotted down together. They work in such close harmony at this time, you can't even say the mind is somewhere else and I am somewhere else. You are at the same place. So it doesn't matter. That is not the key. The key is, wherever mind soul is, are you there where the mind soul is in terms of your attention or is your attention what the mind soul is seeing in front? So instead of thinking about what you are seeing, think about where you are seeing it from. Try it again. Any other question before we get back to the exercise? I'm tied up here, wired. Yeah, I'm on a short leash. <laughs> Okay, we'll, uh, we'll proceed. This, uh, this uh, point which has been raised is very important. How much flexibility do we have to twist and turn our attention? Is it all automatic or do we have a will in it? Most of the time we feel we have a will. We have a will to get up. We put attention getting up. We want to touch something. All right, we want to touch this cup. Shall I touch or not? Yes, I will. Touch it. We are exercising this will all the time. When we use will to do a thing, we automatically carry our attention with it. So when we will that we are going to do it, the attention goes with it. When we will, we will not do it. And the temptation comes, do it. And we say, I will not do it. Temptation says, do it. So there are two directions. Do it, I will not. Do it, I will not. This is happening in the head only, in consciousness. When you say, I will not, you're pulling back to exactly where you are. You're withdrawing. When you act, any karma or any action that requires will to implement takes you to that point where the action is. Any decision not to act and to remain in restraint pulls you back to where you are. So you can employ this will, 
which carries attention with it by refusing to act and withdrawing to your own self. And that also helps in discovering the third eye center. One point I want to make clear that when I say, imagine you are at the third eye center, I am not suggesting imagine a visual image of yourself in front of you. A mistake many people make. Because who I am becomes very vague. If the body is not the self, we do not know if we have any form. So in order to feel we have a form, we begin to picture ourselves to fit in a small head. To fit into a small head, we begin to figure out we are a small little being sitting behind the eyes and we start looking, where is he sitting? And then we can locate, there he is sitting, the head, the back of the head you can see. Sometimes you can move lower and see the neck. And that being, who you say is yourself, is sitting in front of you. And you feel, there you are at the third eye center. That's not true. You are at the third eye center looking at the little being. The little being is your imagination in front of you. And if you open your eyes and want to see the space where you saw that, you'll find it was physically, dimensionally in front of the eyes, not in, inside the eyes. Just because your eyes were closed, it looked, it was inside. It was in the darkness which you created by shutting the eyes. But the actual location where you saw was in front of these eyes and the attempt to see that little being as yourself was being made with these eyes causing a strain on these eyes. That's not what I am suggesting. I am not suggesting that you use strain on the closed eyes to see something that you have to create in front of you. I am suggesting whatever you are seeing, even darkness or any patterns or any light, whatever you are seeing, wherever you are seeing from to start with, without having to focus anywhere, wherever you are seeing it to start with, figure out where that is. And why figure out? Because while figuring out where that is, you are withdrawing your attention automatically because you are pulling back to yourself. Figuring, it, figuring out is not for the purpose of discovery. Figuring out is for the purpose of withdrawing your attention to yourself. Or when you close your eyes, you may see anything or not see anything. Actually, you are seeing something all the time because you are aware that you are either seeing darkness or some light or you can twist the eyes or rub them and you see a lot of other things still there. You can create lights are outside. They can shine through. You can open little eye. You can know that you are still seeing. You are still shutting the eyes. Doesn't mean you are seeing nothing. You are seeing partial darkness. So you are still there. You are still seeing and the darkness is still there. All three elements are present. When you are looking at the darkness or any pattern or any chink of light coming in, when you see that, then figure out there's the light or the darkness or the chink. There I'm seeing. Figure out where I'm seeing from. And you pull back from where you're seeing. You can't see yourself because you are in the process of seeing. You can't see a little being of yourself. Therefore, you have to figure out where you're seeing. Then big changes take place quickly. When you start that, when you want to figure out where you are seeing, the easy way is to figure out where you are seeing from. The little fellow there. Then say, no, that's not the I am seeing. Then you become a big fellow. Huge, as big as the whole sky, the whole space. And then you say, no, that's the body. And the attention goes back into the body. That what I thought I was seeing inside the head, either it was the back of the head or the body, or the little fellow. And you swing between these two till you find out neither this body was seeing nor the little fellow was seeing. You are somewhere in between. The seeing power, which is you, the self, was between the two. As you practice, you come to know who is seeing. That's me. That's not the body. I always thought it was the body. Who is seeing? Not these eyes. So with little patience and practice, you can withdraw attention to the actual seer sitting behind the eyes in this body. Okay, let's practice. More questions may come up if you actually practice. Practice once again sitting behind the eyes. This is of such crucial importance that the success of your meditation in large measure will depend upon successfully seating yourself behind the eyes, which means becoming aware of where you are in the wakeful state. 
is at the third eye center behind the eyes. So close your eyes and imagine that you are behind the eyes. And don't worry about what you are seeing. Let any pattern, any figure, any image come and go in front of you. Don't concentrate on that. Concentrate on being there and figure out how you are there. Yeah, figure out whether you have a form. You can see if you have any hands or arms. You can look around. See inside the head, is there a brain? Can you see the brain? Is there a top of the head? Inside the hair, can you see something? Are the ears, do they look different from inside? Turn around inside the head, figure out what's going on. But don't create an image to uh, turn around. You turn around and see. Begin. Okay. Just contemplate on that. Figure out how it works. <laughs> fill out, fill your consciousness in the brain and figure out how it works. How can it see? How can it think? Can consciousness filled into the brain start thinking? How does consciousness in the brain start thinking? Figure out all these activities of consciousness. Don't be tense in the body. Don't put attention in the body. Put attention on consciousness inside. What is making you see, making you think, making you question, making you contemplate? Shall I count five? One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes. Any improvement? Anybody found it easier this time? Any questions, difficulties? Yes, Sam. Okay. <laughs> yes. Can't we liken it to uh, driving a car or doing something? Uh, you know, when you drive a car, it doesn't about the next appointment. And all the time you're driving the car, but the attention, the true attention is not really on driving. The true attention is actually on the, 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 the thing that you are really thinking about. There's one, there's one difference. <laughs> well, I don't want more accidents to take place on the highways. <laughs> the simile is good so long as you can use this body as a car and yourself as the driver, it's fine. But when you drive a car, you know who you are and your body. And you want to drive this body, if you know who you are and what you look like, it's fine. That's the key. The moment you have been able to discover your astral form inside, there's no problem. Till that time, you tend to take the car as yourself. That causes problem. It's only after you have found out who you are inside the body, there's no problem after that. Meditation is easy. Because then you are using a car. And you know who you are, you know where you are, what you look like. You can press the accelerator, rice buttons, everything is there. But if you don't even know who you are, and you are saying, this is a car, and I am the vague, unseen driver inside, it doesn't, the car doesn't run too well. So you must identify the driver with the self. But I've had the experience of driving and forgot I was driving. <laughs> I have to refer to yesterday's lecture. There is grace and mercy still. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean. Yeah. No, but now we're talking of meditation. Now we're talking of meditation, not of driving cars. And we are using this as an analogy in meditation. We want to find out how our meditation can be successful. We want to find out how we can quickly withdraw our attention to the third eye center and move on and not be pulled back again and again by the body. Now, if the identification of the self is still with this physical body, you can keep on saying it's a car, it's still the body, it's yourself. Saying it doesn't help. You have to experience yourself inside the body, and you are not the body, then who are you? What form do you have? When you can figure that out inside, it becomes easier. Next step of meditation starts immediately after that. But this has to be done. The first step has to be done. Are you there flying freely? Are you hung up in space there? Are you sitting on a floor? Is there a room? Is there a sky? Where are you? What's going on? When you try to figure out where you are, all these questions get answered. Because all these vistas start opening up. And you find you're flying. That you're not tied down because you're not the body. But this only happens 
when you really withdraw attention behind and are your own self other than the body. I guess maybe I'm not making myself clear. I use that analogy in, in the sense that you can concentrate so much on a particular activity that you forget the physical activity that you're doing and given a circumstance, the physical activity can actually take over from the concentrated activity uh, <laughs> if something should occur where the physical activity has to be brought into play. This is happening automatically even if you don't try. That's what I mean. Your heart is beating whether you like it or not. Right. <laughs> Your systems, motor systems are all working on a pre-programmed genetic code. You don't have to do anything. We are talking of the interference of the sensory system. It's the sensory system that is causing a problem. The senses are what are we are attracted to. We open the eyes, want to see what's there. We close our eyes, we still want to see what is there. We hear people talk, we hear nice music, and we shut off the uh, music, and we want to hear what is still there. It is the subjective sensory system that's working. Motor systems are all working automatically. So the physical systems are being taken care of. There's no problem. What is distracting us from knowing who we are are our own subjective sensory systems which are in touch with the memories. And every time we remember something that happened somewhere, the attention goes there. We remember another thing, we go there. People here, while they were trying to be there, they thought of other things. And while momentarily they were there, they immediately went out what they remembered. Is that true? Please raise your hands who had that experience. I didn't even ask because I know so how many had this. It is natural. It is these memories of the sensory experiences of this world that are drawing us out. Therefore, what we are trying to do here is that by exploring what is there, by imagining we are there, we are trying to lower the number of distractions taking us out. And sitting in peace here, the more we relax, the less conscious we are of the body. We relax and sit and concentrate only on figuring out where we are. What happens is that we gradually stop thinking about other things that are pulling us out. So when those things don't pull us out and we are inside, then a new experience starts. You know what brought, brought that to mind? This woman, uh, she was sitting and she was knitting. And she was knitting, you know, uh, knitting is a repetition type of uh, activity. And she's knitting and she's knitting and she got into this deep concentration. And from the knitting and the deep concentration, she went inside. And because of that concentrated uh, repetition of either the knitting or whatever the thought process was for her. Not whatever. The thought process was who is knitting is good enough. If you're knitting and you just start figuring out who's knitting, you'll go in. If you are uh, trying to be behind the eyes and you're figuring out who's trying to be behind the eyes, you'll go in. If you're repeating a mantra and you're concerned with who's repeating the mantra, who's listening to the mantra, you'll go in. Every time, by any means, you withdraw attention to yourself, you go in. And then you find the other experiences which are so distinct that you like to stay there. Till you have the other experiences of light and color which are not related to the memories of this world, it is not attractive. It is dry. This is called dry part of meditation. It's not attractive part of meditation because it's still dark and you're trying to do something as if you have to put an effort, a lot of effort into it and it's not attracting you. There's no pull for it. So this area, this, this stage in meditation has been considered the dry stage. I suppose they've taken the term dry stage and wet stage from the liquor shops. I don't know <laughs> where they got it from, but they call it the dry, the dry stage. So you have to pass the stage when it becomes attractive, when the spiritual meditation, sometimes by this practice, and sometimes by our just forgetting what we are doing. Sometimes in meditation, you just forget what we're doing, just get back. Suddenly you see light. You see the radiant form of the master. You see different things, you wonder how it came. And then when you try to figure that out, it goes. Yeah. Because it came because you were not figuring out that. Yeah. You were with yourself. It came. When you started figuring out the objects, it goes. Right. So the process is very, very simple. Not easy, but simple. It's very simple. And once you achieve it, it's very easy too. You will notice that you will wonder, why couldn't you do it earlier? 
It is so simple and easy. But till you have done it, it is simple but difficult. It is difficult because of our own attachments, our own memories. They pull us and drag us away. Every time for a moment we are here, something else will remind us of some other chore or thing we have to do or what we forgot or what it means or what it is interpreting. We start interpreting, the other concepts start coming back. All the thoughts drive that experience away. So you can't stop thinking, thoughts go on. We are trying to divert the thoughts, trying to channel thoughts to this activity of who the self is. We are trying to channel thinking mechanisms to the question, who am I? Not by somebody else's definition, not by a concept, not by a book, but by my experience. I want to experience who am I? I want to experience if I am not the body, inside the body I am spirit, what do I look like? Who am I? How does it work? I want to see it. I want to be with it. I want to know more about it. Why am I always opening my eyes and seeing outside through this body and not close my eyes and see what is inside me? That kind of consideration withdraws your attention to yourself. That's what we should do. Yes. Does a certain amount of karma need to be paid off before you can have successful meditation? Yeah. But meditation is a way of paying off karma. Because I know if in your outer life you're having uh, difficulties or things, that affects your meditation. Yeah. Good karma must bring you to a stage of seeking. You are being rewarded. Very good karma must bring you to a stage where you can see a perfect living master. The highest karma can bring you to initiation. Very good karma is needed to have the desire to do meditation. And when meditation is taking place, the meditation burns a lot of karma in order to make it successful. Supposing you have a lot of difficulty in, in meditation, you can still keep on doing meditation because it will burn the very karma that's coming in the way. So it's also a means of uh, breaking up the negative karma. So it is the answer. Meditation is the answer if karma itself comes in the way. So even if you're not seeing lights and you haven't gone... Even then it's worthwhile doing it. Because one day then you will see it's burning the karma that's coming in the way. How many of you have a, a mantra or a simran or a repetition of words that you can repeat? Okay. Now in the next exercise, let's use those words. Because that will help us in removing one major diversion that the mind is experiencing. Those who do not have a mantra can coin one. Coin one, make up one. Can make up a temporary, temporary one, one day stand. One day's meditation stand. That means they can have a mantra good for today. And that mantra can be any short phrase expressing love for the beloved. Why am I suggesting this as a temporary mantra? Because if the feeling of love is even partly real towards the beloved, it draws you towards the self. It draws you towards the spirit, the soul automatically. Therefore, if you can coin or make up a mantra that draws you towards the self, Use that as a short phrase. But the object here is not just to express love. The object is to use that phrase for repetition. Regular, deliberate repetition. The mantra should be used to repeat mentally, not with the tongue. You should repeat the mantra in the mind in such a way that you can hear it. If you cannot hear your own mantra, you are not doing it correct. If you can repeat the mantra in your own head, if you can repeat those words, those temporary words in your own head and listen to them, that you can hear the mind repeating and you are listening, you are doing fine. You should repeat loud enough, not physically loud, mentally loud. In your head, they should be loud enough to be heard distinctly. You should be slow in repetition, so every word is distinctly heard and not slurred over. Supposing you choose the mantra, I love you. You don't say, I love you, I love you, I love you. I... That's no mantra. You should distinctly speak every, I love you, I love you. And listen to each word separately. The idea is, when you listen distinctly to a word, your concentration goes not to the word, but to the listener. If you slur over it, the concentration of attention goes to the words. If you listen cleverly, clearly, want to be sure what is being said, then the concentration of attention is at the listener, not at what is being listened. So if you speak distinctly your mantra and repeat distinctly and listen intently, 
listen with as much clarity as possible what is being said by your own mind. It will work. What is the object of the exercise? Object is this mind which was running and remembering things. This mind which was acting as a commentator telling us what these concepts are. This mind which was interpreting things for us while we were trying to be where we are. This mind will be kept busy repeating something and giving us some free time to know who we are. So this is a device. This mantra repetition is a device. It works well. If it doesn't work once, it works second time, third time. The more you practice, you will find it is a very useful device to keep the mind busy in repetition while you explore who you are. And one of the chief distractions is taken away. That is why it was prescribed in the first place. It was not supposed to be only a magical abracadabra. It was supposed to be a practical device for good meditation. So now you repeat the words while you are figuring out where you are. Imagine you are in the third eye center. Imagine you have a chair, imaginary chair. Or imagine you have the same Tibetan rug. Or imagine you have something but inside. And sp spread it around. Sit on it comfortably on that rug inside. And repeat and listen to the words while you are sitting inside. Begin. Don't worry about what you are seeing. Just repeat and listen carefully and stay in the center. Don't follow any images or figures in front. Let them come and go. Repeat slowly and listen. Keep your eyes closed till I count five. One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes. Look this side. Open your eyes. Anybody found this better with repetition? Please raise your hands if you found it better. Thank you.